Okay, if you wanna get faster, you need to eat more and train less. Now, when I got into running, I was absolutely obsessed with it. And I'm that type of personality, and many of you will be able to relate to this, that they equate import equals output. And unfortunately in running, it's absolutely not the case. What I'm gonna to try to do in this video is I'm gonna answer a question that I got in the comments about overtraining, about getting injured, and about how you can course correct that to be able to best manage your personality because it is a good one. It is the perfect personality to be good at any, anything, but specifically in running and specifically in an endurance pursuit. If you can manage it and get the better of it now, rather than later on, after frustration, after kind of like painfully going through setback after setback after setback, if you can do it now, you won't have to do this later. So please learn from my mistakes. Now I've got this question in the comments. Hey Lee, as you planned with the overtraining stuff, I got shin splints and symptoms of low energy for two months. I trained consistently on the bike though, tried to stay disciplined, but I'm still fatigued often. I did a lot of volume. Can you share psychological tips or advice for not overtraining? I recognize it's mostly due to fear of losing fitness, not working hard enough, etc. Cheers. Now, we often look at the pursuit of running or endurance in the wrong way. And we think input equals output when it definitely doesn't. And all the lessons I learned and all the mistakes I made, you can learn them with, without having to go through the pain that I went through. And I know that sounds dramatic, but it's true. When I started, I started late and I wanted to turn it into a full-time gig, into a professional career. And so I didn't think I had time. I was impatient. And so I did as much as I could. I tried to look at all the different areas. And the main things that I did wrong were I was trying to become the lightest possible athlete I could because I knew power to weight was key. And whilst I was basically going through calorific, a calorie deficit diet, I was also trying to build the strongest athlete I could. And by that, I meant I was just incrementally increasing the gradual, gradual or not gradual, I was increasing the volume of the training, I was increasing the amount of fast work, I was increasing the long run, I was increasing the amount of cross training, the amount of weight training, everything together. So I was trying to lose weight, and on a calorie deficit, I was trying to train like an animal. Of course, the wheels fell off. I didn't think I had time available, so I didn't give myself time off. And I'm trying to create this super light athlete and super powerful and fast athlete. And clearly, you know, it's quite obvious looking back, but it was also obvious at the time. I got injured, I got fatigued, and it led to sort of slower performances. And the only thing slower than the overweight athlete that I'd started as that wasn't trained. The only thing slower than that athlete is an injured athlete. And if you're injured whilst you're in shape, there's nothing more, there's nothing more frustrating. And so please, like, learn from my lessons when it comes to this. And I'll try to explain my thinking and how it evolved. And although it seems obvious that, you know, obviously the, the big overweight fat athlete, the only thing slower than him is an injured athlete. Although that seems obvious, it probably took me about seven or eight years to realize this. And that, it, it sort of pains me right now, like learning the hard way to manage my own personality, that I can't just go out there and sort of try to kind of work through uh, fatigue. I can't just go out there and sort of, all of a sudden I'm gonna turn it around on one session. It doesn't work that way. The amount of times on the build up to big races that I tried to steal fitness, I tried to go out there and unnecessarily do an extra session, when in actual fact, my body would have benefited way more from a rest day. On those sessions, and I've got three examples in my head. I'm not gonna go through each by each, but there was this one point, I was crossing my favorite bridge in Granada, just a nice 25K, nothing special to run, but gave me that little bit of zip in the legs. And all of a sudden, calf twinge, and completely out. And I've got a week, uh, the world championships in three weeks, of which, if I would have just got to the start line, even if I would have been 80% fit, but at that time I was 110% fit, even at 80% fit, I would have had a fighting chance. Injured and not making the start line, I've got zero chance. I literally have no chance to win the race. And what I wanted to do, set the world record in that, because I didn't even give myself an opportunity to be at the start line. 
So how the hell kind of does that mentality think you're, it's your personality, you have to harness that strength because it is a strength. Wanting to do too much is a strength, especially when you look at how many people are out there that don't have the motivation, don't have the drive, don't have the discipline. You're way ahead of that, but you're putting yourself behind those people because you're not managing your own personality. That wanting to do more, scared of getting unfit, what it actually is, and I learned this about myself, me trying to steal an extra session, an extra run, that's not me trying to win the race. That's fear of not being in shape. So it's actually a lack of confidence. It's a lack of confidence in the process, the overall training schedule, who I am at that point with all the training behind me. It's fear that, well, what about if my opponent is out there working hard and I'm going to be racing against him on that day? It's, it's literally a lack of confidence. And so that insecurity, you've got to get a grip of it because it is literally harming you instead of harnessing that personality and making it work in your favor, which is incredibly powerful. And what you learn, and, and, and if I just think about that example of me not making a start line, but knowing that I was in world record shape and I wanted to perform, it was my, everything about that race was perfect. The temperature, uh, the humidity, the, the distance from where I needed to travel, I knew the area, it was all, all the, all the stars were aligned, but I didn't even give myself a chance to get on the start line. And I'm not going to go into sort of woulda, shoulda, coulda, because, you know, it's kind of silly talk. But the lesson I learned, and it's a powerful one, is if you can just get to the start line at 80%, because of the personality you've got, you're not going to let yourself down on race day. So even if you're just 80% fit, and that might scare you at first, but rather than sort of taking the risky sessions and getting there 98% or 102% fit, you just get in there 80% fit and you're, or 80, 90% fit and you're feeling good about yourself, that's in a strong position to have consistency over races, over seasons, and over the years. You're not going to let yourself down during a race. So if you're there, your competitive instinct is gonna kick in and you're going to do the best you possibly can for yourself because it's not possible for somebody to go past you and you not to chase them and literally bury yourself and for your heart to be kind of like beating out of your chest and for you to see it on the floor in front. It's not possible for you not to chase that person because it's innate within you. So if you work on that side of your personality and just say, do you know what? I've gotta be confident in my process. I've gotta be confident in the training program that either I've put together myself or, 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 or it's been put together for me, I've got to get myself on that start line because if I get myself on the start line, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take some beating. And if you look at that in the same way that Prefontaine looked at it, you may beat me, but it's going to cost you blood, sweat, and guts in order to do it. Something like that. And that was his philosophy to training. You, you, it's exactly the same as Jakob and Britson the other day. In order to beat him, three guys had to set national records, European records, and almost world records, and, and almost an American records. You know, it's it, that level of performance you can take on board and have it for yourself because that's who you are. Once you get there, you're not going to give anything but your best. And so what, what I'll kind of conclude with is I'd gone through a few of these processes where a lot had gone right, and then right when it counted, it had gone wrong. And I was cycling with a friend of mine who's one of the best cyclists in the last 20 years. And you know, we were talking through this and we were talking about this topic and confidence, etc. And he said to me, and this is when it really hit home. And unfortunately, sometimes it takes somebody of this kind of height or this level in order to say something for us actually to take it in. When even if a guy off the street said this to you, you know it to be true. And what he said to me is the best advice that he ever got was if you want to get faster, you need to train less and eat more. And it's so powerful. It, like, I, I, I have the, the hairs on my neck on, on, I stood up at the moment because it's so powerful and it hits home and you know it to be true. Because of your personality, you are a winner. And so if you just let the winner perform, even at 80%, he's going to be there or thereabouts.